This is episode three in our podcast series on informal English language learning for newcomers. The series supports the BC Settlement and Integration Services or BC SIS program. This episode is volunteers and supporting specialized learner needs in ELL programming. We gratefully acknowledge the financial support of the province of British Columbia through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. As a provincial umbrella association, AMSA would like to acknowledge that BC is home to 198 First Nations. We express and recognize the privilege that we have as settlers on this land. We acknowledge that AMSA's operations are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. I am Alice Podell, AMSA program coordinator. My work supports the BCSS program. I would like to start with some background on our topic today. For newcomers, English language skills are an important factor in settlement and integration. They increase newcomers' ability to fully participate in BC society. English language skills can reduce isolation. They contribute to community connections and to a sense of belonging. At the same time, they build confidence and independence. English skills are needed to find and retain viable employment and for workplace communication, expectations and safety. These thoughts reflect the objectives of the BCSIS program. It's why English language training is such an important service. Some newcomers like those with temporary immigration status are not eligible for the LINK program. That's the language instruction for newcomers to Canada program. It's for permanent residents or protected persons and they can take LINK language classes at no cost. Newcomers who are not eligible for LINK still need language training for all the reasons just mentioned. That's where informal language training comes in. The flexibility of informal English training programs can really be ideal for newcomers who are experiencing change and uncertainty. There's a lot of benefit from classes that are not as structured as LINK, yet still help meet their need. Most BCC service providers offer informal language training like conversation groups and tutoring for English practice. Almost all BCC clients are eligible for and benefit from informal language practice. This work is done by the organization themselves with high number of clients to support from a wide variety range of language levels and with unique needs, creative approaches and fiscal efficiency are vital. Volunteers can contribute to organizational capacity with their own skills and knowledge, especially when they're well equipped with training and resources. There's no doubt that volunteer management and training can be vital in service delivery for many organizations programs. We'll talk about the quick responsive shift to online program and service delivery during the pandemic. We'll look at factors around digital literacy and supporting multi-barrier clients. And let's also consider the future and what that might look like in terms of blended learning. That's what this podcast is all about. Our guests today are all experts in English language learning for newcomers. They are Janet Less, ESL Coordinator at Chilliwack Learning Society, Paulette Quirkham, Access to English Coordinator at Archway Community Services, and Karen Alvarez Torres, Manager, Language Training and Literacy Programs at Diversity Community Services Society. I would also like to introduce our guest interviewer, Bahar Taheri. Bahar has collaborated on many AMSA and BCSIS projects. I'm so pleased to have Bahar here to chat with our guests. They're all ready to share with you, so let's get started. I'm so pleased to welcome Janet Less, ESL Coordinator at Chilliwack Learning Society. Janet has been coordinating the ESL Volunteer Tutor Program since 2012. She also works as an on-call instructor for the Chilliwack LINK Program and CLBPT Assessment Service. Janet is passionate about making Chilliwack a welcoming and inclusive community. 
Janet, to start off, tell our listeners about the informal English language learning programming at Chilliwack Learning Society and the types of clients that you serve. The Chilliwack Learning Society started out in 1990 as Chilliwack's literacy organization, and we continue to evolve to support learning of all kinds. Our ESL volunteer tutor program doesn't receive funding from federal or provincial programs that support newcomers. So the advantage of this for us is that we're not restricted in who we serve or what we offer. So we serve about 200 immigrants and refugees per year with one-on-one -on -one tutoring, small groups and classes. Some are Canadian citizens or permanent residents. Some are refugee claimants. Some have a, a student or work visa or a visitor visa as parents of international students. Uh, we help university students and also many newcomer seniors. So basically any adult living in Chilliwack who wants to improve their English is welcome. Great. Um, and then how does the program operate in normal times uh, versus how has it changed during the pandemic? Yeah, well, in normal times, tutors and learners typically meet at a public library and now everything is on Zoom or sometimes Skype. And this is also the case with training and workshops. So it was a big transition for sure. But overall, I would say online learning is working really well. And like one of our volunteers said recently, working with our learners is a gift when it's so easy to retreat into our, our own little world and worry. So I think it's been a year of much English learning and connecting in Chilliwack. Mm -hmm. And I understand the volunteers are essential to the program. How many volunteers do you typically have and what sort of backgrounds do they have and what is their role in the program? So each year we have about 65 active volunteers, a few university students, some working people who want to contribute and connect to the newcomer community. But the majority of our volunteers are seniors who work either part-time or are retired. And uh, volunteers meet with learners one-on-one -on -one, and they also lead conversation circles and other classes. We welcome their input in anything in our program. And some volunteers stay in the program for a short time and others for many years. So managing that many volunteers must be a really complex task, especially doing it online. How do you recruit volunteers and then provide orientation and training so that they're effective in their roles? Well, we really don't advertise. Uh, most of our new volunteers are referred by existing volunteers or they hear about our program online or in the community. Chilliwack really has an amazing community of volunteers with a strong commitment to giving. Um, we used to have a training program for volunteers, but it's always difficult to make various schedules work. So now we just have a single session orientation. And after a volunteer is matched, I support them as much or as little as they want. So volunteers get to know their learners' needs and goals much better than I do. And we give them a lot of autonomy in how the tutoring goes, but I'm always there to help in any way that I can. So new volunteers receive a resource binder. That's now an online folder. And we have monthly workshops, for example, on grammar or pronunciation, on adult learning or preparing students for tests, topics like that. So, and for volunteers who can't make it to workshops, I email the material afterwards. I email lessons on the first of each month so tutors can count on that, uh, but many choose their own. Okay, great. That sounds like a really great um, approach to Kind of doing a little bit of professional development with the volunteers on an ongoing basis. Um, so that takes me to my next question. When working with volunteers, it's so important to keep them feeling involved, effective, and appreciated. It would be interesting to hear how you do that in normal times and then how you've been doing that during the pandemic. Well, in normal times, we, we have an annual appreciation dinner in May for all our volunteers and a potluck for learners and uh, volunteers in December. And some of our monthly workshops are a lunch and learn. So volunteers get to know each other. Um, and we sure miss all of that now, but more volunteers 
are attending our monthly workshops on Zoom than when they were in person. So that's helping uh, tutors connect with me and with each other. I think though that most volunteers feel effective and appreciated just by what they're doing. Uh, they are appreciated by their learners. And it's clear that their learner is making progress. So that's affirming and rewarding. And that's what keeps ESL volunteers motivated and me as well. Yeah, and I guess c connecting online is a lot easier. You don't have to get in your car and go somewhere. So those monthly meetings, probably you get more people attending because of that. Um, yes, and even the tutoring sessions, we yeah. you know have a lot less uh, counseling of meetings. Yeah, and I think I think if you're especially during the pandemic, we were all a little bit isolated. Um, having a time that you get to meet someone online and have a chat is actually probably really nice for a lot of people, both the learner and the tutor. So, yeah, yeah I think the program was probably helpful in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so my next question would be for one one to one tutoring. It must be very important to have a good match between the tutor and the learner. How do you place learners with so many different levels and factors to consider? Do you assess the learner first? We don't have a good assessment tool for learners and that's something I, I would like to develop. It's on my to-do list. Um, some learners are in ESL classes, so we know their level. Uh, many have a particular goal, such as improving their speaking and listening with a tutor. So then I just have a conversation with them to check their level. And at our first meeting, I'll ask learners to read aloud um, or do a writing sample sometimes. We refer to the Canadian language benchmarks quite closely, but um, assessing is nothing very accurate, um, also not for, for progress testing. Um, a good match between a tutor and learner is key for sure. But the reality is that some learners are challenging to work with and some are easy. And also some volunteers have just a natural aptitude and personality to work with almost anyone and others do not. So we do our best. And sometimes a match is made basically on availability. You know, some, somebody needs mornings or somebody needs evenings and certain days of the week. Um, it's always sad when a match doesn't work out, especially for me when I think the volunteer would be great if they just had a more suitable learner, but Yes, this is the reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess doing that all online must be a little bit more challenging too. Um, and then, so how do you support learners and volunteers who have low digital literacy skills? Well, the pandemic has forced many of us to improve our digital literacy skills, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so for anyone having difficulty, I ask them to get help, typically from their kids. Mm. and we've helped many be successful on Zoom, which is very user friendly, as you know. And some learners are using their phone, which isn't ideal, but okay for conversation practice, it works. And when someone doesn't have a great computer or internet, I, I find we just need to be really patient. Um, and we did lose some volunteers when the pandemic forced us online. And a few of those are returning now still. Um, as it drags on. And we also gained volunteers and learners who like to work from home. And, you know, learners are not going to China for two months and volunteers are not traveling either. So digital tutoring is, is not seeing our numbers drop at all. Well, that's good news. That's really good that people are still engaged, both the learner and um, the volunteers as well. Um, and then, so tell us about some other ways your volunteers connect with learners and um, how volunteers are supporting them during the pandemic. So most of the tutoring is on Zoom um, and there's some who use different, uh, you know, Skype or FaceTime or WhatsApp. Um, but there's also learning back and forth with email for improving grammar and writing. And another tutor and learner are reading on the phone. And last summer we had some outdoor distance meetings and I expect that will happen again as the weather improves. But Zoom is definitely the tool of choice uh, for most of us. And once people get to know it, they, they really like it. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's creative, everyone gets creative, right? As time goes by, we all figure out different ways to use Zoom and 
um, support clients and support um, learners. Um, and so for you, what has been some of your favorite resources and how do you use them? Well, our favorite is ESL Library, which is a subscription service of absolutely excellent lessons of all kinds based in Winnipeg. And we have purchased subscriptions for some volunteers. And I have an account where I can share lessons with learners and volunteers. Um, many of our volunteers are finding websites to share with their learners on Zoom. And they share photos, short stories, conversation questions, um, videos even. It really is a, a very convenient way to connect with learners and, and have a wealth of resources at your fingertips, literally. So, and when we're not tutoring online, we use ESL curriculum like Ventures um, and Side by Side quite a bit. And another great resource we use is Track It Forward. Our volunteers record their meetings online through this website. And then I can pick up on how things are going every week. Okay, and is Track It Forward a subscription-based or is it a free resource? Yes, we, we, uh, we pay an annual fee for it. Oh, okay, but yeah, that's a really good tool to be able to see how the sessions are going um, and do a little bit of quality check, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, um, Janet, what inspires you most about your work? For sure, seeing newcomers gain English skills and becoming confident new Canadians. Uh, that inspires me and our whole team of amazing volunteer tutors. Uh, they inspire me and our learners inspire all of us. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Janet. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Our listeners can learn more about the ELL programming at Chilliwack Learning Society and the resources that Janet has mentioned um, will all be referred to in the podcast show notes info sheet. Thank you, my thank pleasure. You. Now I'd like to introduce Paulette Corkum. Paulette is the Access to English Coordinator at Archway Community Services. She coordinates a community-based adult literacy program which provides language instruction for newcomers in both formal EAL classes and informal English practice ELL sessions led by volunteer tutors. Paulette has embraced the role of an educator for most of her adult life and, has formerly, and was formerly an ELSA link instructor in various community-based programs. Since 2007, she has supported refugees both in her local community and in the camps along the Thai Myanmar Burma border. Paulette gets personal satisfaction from building successful connections between newcomers and tutors while providing resources and support to the many dedicated volunteers whose participation makes the ELL program possible. Paulette. To start off, tell our listeners about the Access to English programming at Archway and the types of clients you serve. Our program um, at Access to English is, um, it started in 2008 uh, with six tutors and 18 learners. Uh, we serve uh, refugee claimants, temporary foreign workers, and um, naturalized Canadian citizens who are on a pathway to either um, permanent residency, or they are looking for employment training. Great. And how does the program operate in normal times? And how has that changed during the pandemic? Well, in normal times, we um, or I typically receive an application or a volunteer inquiry. Um, after I receive the, um, the inquiry, I will contact the um, prospective tutor and have them create an account on our uh, Better Impact, uh, which is a management software program that we use here at Archway. So I have them complete the, um, the profile and also do an application at that time. After I receive the um, application, contact the um, tutor for an interview. Um, we, um, I find out some of the things that um, the tutor has experience in or their interest in tutoring for our program. And, um, and then uh, after the interview is over, we check our references and then we also uh, wait for a criminal record release. 
After we received that, uh, we, um, or I contacted the tutor again for uh, an orientation appointment. Uh, the orientation, um, during that time, we discussed things like um, the history of Archway Community Services. We talked about responsibilities and um, expectations for tutors and um, talk a little bit about establishing boundaries, um, some um, other um, workshops that perhaps are coming up, but it's, it's more of a general overview. Uh, we get into more detail when we do um, the actual um, workshops. Uh, since COVID, of course, everything has changed. Um, all visits now are by appointment, uh, no drop-ins by clients, and also um, everything has moved to online, uh, including even the application process for our learners. It's a fillable form now. So a lot of changes for us um, and challenges as well during that time. Yeah, but that sounds like a really good onboarding program that you've established. Um, is your formal ELL work with clients all one-to-one -one, or do you have any group sessions as well? Actually, due to a large volume of, um, of learners that we have in our programs, we do mostly uh, small group sessions. We do try to accommodate learners as they specifically requested one-to-one. Uh, -one. Um, if we have um, tutors available. Um, since we service many uh, temporary foreign workers, there's um, a, a great need for uh, informal ELL uh, programming in the evenings. So prior to the pandemic, uh, we offered a midweek evening program where we brought in a group of six tutors and uh, they each led a small group. Uh, in our program, we have uh, what we call um, a volunteer tutor or volunteer mentor, tutor mentor. And um, she was able to supervise um, those uh, sessions and um, provided um, some um, expertise to the tutors and also was able to jump in if there was a need, um, provide lesson plans for, for these tutors and um, was just able to offer um, support for those evening sessions. Um, this was something new for our tutors who don't typically uh, come together as a group. And it really provided a great opportunity for social uh, connections and um, just a learning community for, um, for tutors that uh, typically are somewhat disconnected and really only see each other for um, events or training sessions. I see that volunteers are essential to the program uh, as tutors. So tell us about the structure of a tutor mentor and volunteer tutors and how that works. Okay, uh, our volunteer mentor has a supportive role in the tutor learner relationship. She uh, basically provides resources and advice to our tutors, whether they're new or experienced tutors. Uh, since um, she also uh, liaisons between um, the learner and the tutor, and also between um, the tutor and um, myself, the uh, coordinator. Uh, since we've moved to online uh, instruction, she has taken on um, an incredible challenge to um, <laughs> train mm -hmm. all of our uh, volunteer tutors how to do online sessions. And uh, I think that definitely she deserves um, a, a big thank you and a huge reward for, uh, for the hours that she spent, um, you know, um, familiarizing tutors with um, online resources and just working with them until they feel totally confident and are willing to independently um, teach, um, you know, a class online without her being in the background in case something goes wrong or they can't share a screen or, or something of that sort. Yeah, that's a big role for her. I guess she's a little it bit is. of tech support, a little bit yeah. of training, a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Yeah. And, um, so um, leading into the next question is how many volunteers do you typically have? And then what sort of backgrounds do they have? 
Sure. We have um, probably right now about 25 to 30 tutors. We've had as many as over 50. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, actually, our numbers drastically dropped. And many of our tutors, um, you know, didn't feel that they could um, continue, uh, especially when they were being asked to continue online. Um, our tutors are um, primarily, I would say, come from a, a teaching or education background. We certainly have other professionals um, from um, the fields of medicine or uh, business who also, um, you know, are, are tutors for us. Uh, we, and we also have students who come to us from um, universities and um, need those volunteer hours for their program. And then we have others who just have a personal interest in helping someone in the community improve their job prospects or even improve their um, English language. Okay, and then how do you recruit all of these volunteers? And then once you've recruited them, how do you provide the orientation and training so that they're effective in their role? Uh, with recruiting, we, um, it's usually word of mouth or uh, referral from within our archway programs. We do do some advertising um, at community events and also through social media, but, um, but primarily word of mouth, uh, one tutor telling another a friend or colleague um, about our program. Orientation and training can be somewhat of a daunting task, but usually, um, Tutors don't come to us all at once. So uh, depending on the timing, uh, we would organize either a one-to-one -one session or if we have a number of new tutors coming at once, we would organize a small group orientation. Uh, one, um, one thing that we have done that I think has been quite effective, especially for tutors who are new, um, is that we also, because we do formal programming here as well, we will place the volunteer tutor into a formal class and that gives them an opportunity to have some exposure to a second language classroom if that's something they have never experienced and it also gives them some uh, some real sort of comfort in that it's it, it becomes more familiar and then they're willing within a short period of time to say you know now i'm ready to start tutoring so, so I think that's a good way to kind of onboard some tutors who don't have the background or experience. Mm, uh, yeah, that's a really good practice. It sounds like a bit of a promising practice that um, our listeners can kind of take on to their organizations, because I think that's a good way for a tutor to see um, how an English class runs and kind of what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, and then with all the volunteers you're recruiting, how do you retain them? How do you make sure they stay with you? Well, retention really has not been a problem in our program. We have um, many tutors who've been with us over five years, and we even have a few that have been with us over 10 years. So um, I think um, the key thing with volunteers is that they need to feel that they belong, uh, that they're part of a team, and part of my role is to build relationships. So uh, it's not always always about the tangible rewards, um, gifts or special lunches. But I think sometimes it's just following up on a personal conversation, uh, asking about family, talking about um, a vacation that, you know, they've just come back from something like that, where we're making personal connections with tutors. Um, I think that is, is key to retention. How do you create a good match between tutor and learner? Do you assess the learner's language level and then base it on that? I think that uh, the assessment is certainly a part of, of, that, of creating that good match, but we also look at the application and also glean some information um, related to um, the learner and the tutor as we're doing interviews. Um, when I talk to a tutor initially, I try to establish their comfort level for low level learners or sometimes even even high level learners. Um, also, something else that we do in our program is once the tutor has been onboarded, we send them learner profiles 
So maybe we would send out two or three of potential candidates for learners. And that way the tutor uh, has a say in, uh, in the learner that they're, um, you know, uh, wanting. And we're looking for the best fit always. That's, that's our goal uh, when we're looking for a good match. So we feel that if the tutor has some say in, in that selection process, then that contributes toward a better match. Oh, that's a really great approach, actually, just to see if they find any commonalities or, yeah. some, you know, mm -hmm. that way that the match might last longer um, right. and be a better fit. Yeah. And so um, how important is it to be flexible in your approach to the delivery of the ELL program? Do you have the freedom to adjust and customize the tutoring to meet the needs of the learner? Yes, uh, we do do some uh, tailoring. Um, but usually when the um, learner comes to us, they have already um, sort of made it known or, or tell us that uh, what they're really looking for. If they're looking for um, test prep for IELTS or CELPIP, or if they need a food safe certificate or help with uh, the driving test, they usually let us know those things. And then we put out a call to our tutors uh, because these types of uh, situations are usually shorter term than some that we have. And so once we put out that call, um, usually there are a couple of tutors who especially uh, enjoy short term assignments as opposed to something longer. So they will uh, let us know. Um, and, um, and that's how basically we tailor our tutoring. That's really great that you can kind of have that intentional um, match for a shorter period of time to kind of meet the needs of the learner. Um, and then that takes me to my next question. How do you support learners and volunteers who have low digital literacy skills? Well, it takes incredible time and patience. And um, as it relates to learners, it's usually a double challenge because they not only have low digital literacy skills, but they also have low literacy skills. So um, what we have been doing for those learners that really don't have perhaps even a computer and are, are struggling even using a phone, we have um, a loaning system where we have purchased um, Chromebooks and we loan them out to our learners and a couple of our tutors even, um, actually. So um, we provide, um, you know, the setup help and also um, just continuing support for them. So uh, it takes uh, a much longer time to get them comfortable, but um, it's a kind of a work in progress. But we're seeing good results. And uh, I think there's a lot of personal satisfaction uh, that learners are feeling because they now can uh, access their English classes online. Yeah, exactly. I think with access to technology, digital literacy, um, it's so important right now. So the fact that you're offering those supports as well on top of um, literacy skills um, and English language skills. I think it's, it's really, really amazing. Um, and then how do you support multi-barriered learners? For multi-barriered learners, we recognize that we need a special type of tutor um, to meet their needs. Thankfully, uh, we have tutors that have um, amazing experience. Um, they're trauma-informed. We have some special ed uh, tutors who have that background. And we also have um, tutors who have medical backgrounds. So we have called on them, um, you know, on those occasions where uh, we have a multivariate learner in our program. In addition to that, uh, Archway has over 90 programs that uh, we can refer our learners to. So, um, so I think we, we cover, um, you know, those particular learners as, um, as best we're able. 
Yeah, and it sounds like a very holistic approach to, um, you know, providing services for multi-barriered uh, learners. So you're also referring them to different programs and making those connections as well. And I think we've learned so much from you um, during our, our short chat, um, but you must have quite a range of resources for the program and for the volunteers. So what are some of your favorite resources that you could re recommend for others and our listeners? Well, we do have an extensive physical library um, here at the office. And uh, we also have uh, an online cataloging system called TinyCat that we use. And tutors can search that, uh, request resources, and renew resources without even coming into the office. So that has been uh, certainly a good resource for us. Um, Recently, we did a top 10 for tutors, um, asking them to tell us their favorite resources. And uh, actually, the number one resource was the same as Janet's. Uh, it's the ESL library. <laughs> so, uh, so everyone loves that resource. And uh, so our tutors definitely have, have used that. Uh, quite um, a lot since they started online. Uh, ESL Fast is another one that was right up there. And also Randall's um, ESL's, um, what is it? ESL Cyber Listening Lab. Uh, that's another one for listening activities that uh, the tutors seem to really enjoy. That's such a good idea to ask the tutors um, their top 10, because it really gives you insight and you can kind of pass it on to the next cohort of um, tutors. And then my other question was about Tiny Cat Library. Is that a subscription online platform or is that an internal? It is a subscription online, yes. But it's not, it's not very expensive, so definitely uh, worthwhile looking into. Great. And then my last question is, um, tell me what inspires you um, most about the work that you're doing? Um, my inspiration comes from the success stories that tutors share with me um, and the satisfaction that tutors express um, regarding how the, the experience with their learners um, has changed them. And that gives me inspiration then to um, reach out more and try to find uh, innovative ways to um, increase our programming, to offer um, new programs. Yeah, definitely. I think for, we always think about the benefits to the learner, but I think that there's a lot of benefits to the volunteers and the tutors as well. Yes. Um, so thank you so much, Paulette. Our listeners can learn more about the Access to English program at Archway Community Services and about Paulette's resources by referring to the podcast show notes in Sheet. Thank you. For our last speaker, I'd like to welcome Karen Alvarez-Torres. Karen is the Manager of Language Training and Literacy Programs at Diversity Community Services Society. She has worked for over 15 years teaching ESL to international students, Language Instruction for Newcomers to Canada, or LINK, in Vancouver and Surrey, as well as managing LINK programs in Coquitlam and Surrey. As manager of language programs for Diversity Community Resources Society, Karen ensures that vulnerable newcomers facing multiple barriers to learning have the access and support they need to be successful in LINK classes. Karen, I've spoken with two English language learning experts who have a lot of expertise recruiting, supporting, and managing volunteers who are essential to their programs. We touched on the topic of improvisations made to program delivery during the pandemic, digital literacy, and supporting multi-barriered clients. Those are some of the areas I'd like to explore a little more with you. And let's also consider the future and what that might look like in terms of blended learning. That's a lot to think about in a short time. Karen, what are some specific challenges that lower level learners and multi-barriered learners experience in normal times and then in COVID times? Uh, in, in normal times, uh, our, the multi-barrier uh, learners that we have uh, diversity would be mostly in our link assistance and readiness classes, which are actually link classes, um, but they're specifically designed for multi-barrier learners. And those classes are supported by volunteers. 
and also by teaching assistants and um, through an individualized curriculum for those, those specific clients. Um, and the, the multi-barrier clients are referred to us through uh, regular link classes and also from the wider community. Um, so the, the clients themselves might uh, come to us with little or no formal education. Um, they, those clients would require uh, literacy, uh, literacy training, both um, in written and spoken language. And um, they may be refugees who have experienced dislocation and, and violence. And so those clients might be struggling with um, mental health or with physical um, health. And uh, they may also be seniors. They may, they may uh, come to us with very large families that are difficult to accommodate in the lower mainland. Um, that might also include financial barriers as well. Um, there may be physical uh, barriers, mobility issues. And we have had some clients come to us who are on the autism spectrum as well. And they've been referrals from outside of the link community um, simply because there is nowhere else for them to go to get uh, language training. Uh, so that was pre-COVID. Um, in, in the COVID period, I guess that's where we're calling it now, <laughs> the COVID period, um, it was important just to remain connected. And everyone at the very beginning felt really um, kind of afraid, and and so the importance of just for the teachers and for the and for the students, just knowing that they were all still there and connected was really really important. Um, that was in the short term, and then as the COVID year went on, it became evident that this was not short term, that language learning solutions need to, needed to be found. And so uh, we started sending out mail out packages to all of our low level learners. So literacy, multi-barrier, um, CLB1 as well. And so that kind of bridged the gap in the, in the middle term, but the new barrier of digital access um, and well, digital literacy, but mostly digital, digital access, um, that new barrier started to emerge in the sort of in the later part of the of the COVID year. Yeah, so a lot of different things to think about. And then also in the as you noticed, it went from short term to long term, it's really about pivoting your programming to make sure that you can continue to serve um, different clients from all the different backgrounds you mentioned. So at your organization was a shift to online learning strictly as a result of the pandemic? Or was it a logical and perhaps more essential progression? It, it was a more of a logical progression, although the speed at which it had to happen was was unusual. So um, we had already begun to use Avenue, which was Learn IT to Teach in the old days, probably about a year before before the pandemic hit. So um, the CLB five six students were already um, online and, and using Avenue. We had anticipated um, moving to a blended model with uh, CLB3 and higher. And um, we already knew at that time, this was pre-COVID, that, that there was among newcomers, um, adult newcomers, uh, a lack of technology. Uh, a lack of tools for working online that was already out there. I think it was around, you know, it seemed SFU did a study and it was, I think, around 55% of newcomer adults did not have or did have access to uh, technology. So roughly half. And we did a needs assessment at the beginning of the pandemic. And for our clients, it was, it was I think, 56% 56, 56 um, had the tools. So they had a computer, they had a tablet. And we, we just assumed that that was the, the, the base necessity for, for studying, for learning online would be to have a computer and a tablet. We had never considered a telephone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this wasn't what we had thought would be, we'd be, we would be thinking about, of course, at that time. Um, so the pandemic really pushed online learning um, in, the, in all of our programs. And it's, it's become, it's at the forefront of our teaching practice now. 
And um, the way that that's evolved is that for teachers, digital literacy, teaching that and teaching language learning and language learning are, they're, they're integrated. And that has turned out to be really effective. And so it's become a, um, it's enriched teaching practice. So, so I can't see that we'll ever be going back to what we were doing before. It's just too integrated and it's actually really effective. So, so that's kind of exciting. That's a benefit. Yeah, and there's so many innovative approaches, you know, once you start thinking about, oh, I can do this online, I can do that. But if, if a person doesn't have access to the technology to, to take in all those different programs and resources, then that's obviously a barrier. Um, and so for the specialized needs of low learners and multi-barrier clients, is online learning a realistic option in the long term? Yeah. Uh, we don't see it as we don't see it as being an option um, in the sense that that we would go online with uh, with all of our our instruction for uh, low level learners and certainly not for multi barrier learners. Just the limitations of Zoom mm -hmm. uh, make it very difficult because it's it's a two D space um, and. Uh, you can't work on on anything that requires motor skills. So, you know, pen and pencil. It's a space where where socially significant gestures are are lost. There, it's not the same. Um, it also the the instructors at the literacy level and multi barrier with multi barrier clients uh, can create materials, but the the Zoom environment skews and diminishes some of the, the aspects that are really important. So um, left, right, um, paper orientation, you know, those things are, they, they just become skewed in the, in the, um, in the Zoom environment. Um, I think one of, the, one of the other things that we're really uh, aware of is that, that multi-barrier clients have, have so many needs and um, in the online in the online environment, those there isn't a safe space, and and some of those needs may not be met. Um, especially women who are experiencing violence, they they can't get to a safe space. They can't talk about what's happening. So um, I think that that's a, a concern, and we would want to be face to face to um, facil facilitate all of that. Um, one of the things that we've that we've found, you know, um, in the in the um, online world is that before we had volunteers and teaching assistants working uh, with our multi barrier clients in LARC classes, and what happened in the pandemic was that the family became that support. So family members, you know, especially um, um, teenagers, were helping um, their parents. Um, get onto Zoom or um, to use their technology. So that created a kind of a multi-generational um, aspect to the work. And there are, be are benefits to that. that. That means that parents are more connected to their kids talking about and using the technology that the kids are using. Um, but the drawbacks are that it, it adds a burden to the family members to be supporting their, um, their parents and other family members to do their online classwork. Yeah, and I think that's similar to pre-COVID as well. Um, oftentimes, parents are leaning on children or you know their teenage youth in their in their families to do the um, translation and read important documents for them. So um, I guess that carries over when you're doing online services as well. Um, and then, so thinking about the future about blended on about blended learning. The technology that's required presents a whole additional set of challenges. How do you overcome that for low-level learners? Um, the key to uh, to overcoming that in the beginning was just um, flexibility and um, patience and meeting uh, students where they were at with digital literacy and also where they were at in terms of the technology that they had. Um, and it was... In the beginning, it was it actually worked quite well because some of the teachers were not not that comfortable, and so it was there was a feeling that everyone was kind of working toward the same goals, roughly at the same 
place. <laughs> and, you know, it worked quite well for that reason. Um, teachers became more comfortable, students became more comfortable, you know, many of the students, even at the lower levels were on zoom, they were on WhatsApp. Um, so even the, the uh, multi barrier um, CLB one literacy students, they were all um, feeling quite, I think they have uh, begun to feel quite empowered. They are able to function in the digital world, which is um, absolutely essential. And it was essential even before COVID. So, yeah. so that's been a, a really positive aspect. Um, you know, it's it's a positive thing that's emerged. Um, however, the digital divide is is still a problem. And for learners who are using a phone or don't even have a phone to use or share a phone, um, this is all very difficult. So they're they're really still only at the stage where they're connected but they're not able to really progress in language learning. Yeah, I was reading a report that um, newcomer families, specifically newcomer government assisted families only have one phone for the whole family. So yeah. they're using that for link, they're using that for calling back home, their children are using it for games um, or whatever the children, you know, youth and children are doing. So <laughs> I think though that there is a need for digital literacy and anything usually with technology the more you use it the better you get at using it that's the whole thing of it the more time you spend so I think that the fact that you're moving programs online you know be out of necessity is actually really helping newcomers I agree that tech competency is essential for newcomers to move their lives forward to find and retain a job and so much more so whose responsibility is it to provide the digital access and training to ensure the equity Ultimately, the responsibility for um, equal access to education is, is the responsibility of the commons. You know, I think that tech supports could be viewed very much the same way as, as say, transportation supports have always been seen in our programs. So, um, you know, I do think that, that there is a responsibility for the commons to um, to create that access and, and maintain it. Um, and I do see that, that we probably will go sort of more in that direction. We, um, we're already um, building our inventories of um, tablets and computers, you know, that all happened this year. So that is happening and I see that continuing. Um, I think that the best, the best way to uh, move forward is, is to do some of the things that, that have been successful already. Things like providing child minding to mothers so they can study um, and focus on, on their language learning, um, providing transportation, providing digital access. Um, you know, these are the things that have worked in the past to, um, to help newcomers reach their settlement goals. So I see that as being the way forward as well. And what would you say that a future with blended learning uh, looks like from an equity point of view? Um, well, I, from our experience this past year, it, it looks like uh, CLB four and higher CLB four. We have we have only up to CLB six, but the, it looks like CLB four to six is is well able to manage all of their studies online. As long as they have access to their instructor and and um, and digital access as well, um, and they seem to have um, the higher levels seem to come to our program with more of the advantages, um, and they definitely, by and large, have computers that just you know English language um, ability and and you know greater um, access to the things that are necessary seem to go hand in hand. So it's at the lower levels that, that the most need is for face-to-face, -face, for, um, tech supports and so on. So we see CLV three and lower, uh, being, those are the levels that will require, I think, more face-to-face. -face. We won't, uh, we don't want to see them go online because they need community connections, they need um, language and digital, digital literacy supports. So I think we wanna be providing that face-to-face -face for the most part. Some of digital literacy is, is going to involve 
um, moving even those levels onto more independent learning, but you want to do that gradually and make sure they're getting the other supports before you move them online. Definitely. I think a lot for lower levels, um, you know, English language uh, circles are, are a real place that they go for social connection as well. So um, yeah, the blended model will probably really serve them well in the future. Um, yeah. And then my last, well, second to last question is, what are some of your favorite resources that you like to share with our listeners? Um, the, the resource that is, uh, one of the resources that is really popular among all of our teachers is, is called Learning Chocolate. Oh. It's a really good name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's uh, learningchocolate.com. And uh, we also have a, a Google Drive that uh, all of our teachers and we have a support supervisor on our staff who um, manages resources too. So we have various um, different websites and, and YouTube videos that are used and those are all on our Google Drive. Um, and I'm hoping that, I know that um, there's a, a resource that um, Lori has put together. I'm hoping those links will be provided there. Um, and then of course, some um, teacher created resources. The teachers have been really creative and, and have um, created some of their own um, really great resources. And I've included a PowerPoint that's uh, for teaching the alphabet that one of our instructors, Wendy Thompson has created. So, yeah, we're using lots of different things and, and teachers tend to have their favorites that they share with one another. So those are some of them. That's great. It sounds like teachers are being creative and innovative in this new digital teaching world um, that, that we've all had to kind of jump on in the last year. Um, and so my last question is, tell us what inspires you about your work. I'm inspired by educators and learners. <laughs> And especially this past year, um, I've, I've absolutely been awed by what I've seen in, in the settlement sector, in LINK, in education in general. It's, it's just absolutely awe-inspiring to see what the creativity and flexibility that everyone demonstrated and just the general desire to move forward. Um, it's, that's, what, that's what inspires me. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. I really enjoyed listening to your approaches to English language learning in an informal setting. I was intrigued by your thoughtful strategies for working with volunteers based on your depth of experience and your methods of supporting newcomers who each have unique, complex, and often specialized needs. Janet and Paulette described their program's flexible and effective approaches to learning that adapt to learners' needs rather than the other way around. They find practical ways to accommodate multiple level of learners. Each program uses active learning that helps students build confidence and self-reliance. They're responsive to current circumstances and to emerging needs. And that's critical in times of constant change. Their programs demonstrate the power of flexible learning and the energy that comes when you're not locked into a fixed training program. As Janet and Paulette explained, volunteers can be absolutely essential for settlement service organizations delivering informal English language learning. They described how they recruit volunteers and provide orientation and training to make sure they get a strong start. They spoke about the ways they retain those valuable volunteers through ongoing support, professional development, recognition and appreciation, and building a sense of community among volunteers. A key element of volunteer effectiveness is making good matches between their skills, interest and capability and their role in the program. This includes suitable matches between volunteer tutors and learners, and in the case of group work, between volunteer and diverse level of learners. I hope this discussion will inspire others to volunteer in an English language learning program and make a difference in a newcomer's life in a very meaningful way. With all our speakers, Janet, Paulette, and Karen, we talked about the massive shift to online learning as a result of the pandemic 
and the challenges with getting learners as well as some volunteers up to speed with technology. They have adapted to new technology and online delivery methods and help participants develop digital literacy skills. The creativity and tenacity in making that happen is remarkable. In spite of the challenges, it's opened up inclusivity for many more learners and has set the stage for a post-pandemic future that includes a blended learning model. No matter how difficult it can be, tech competency is essential for newcomers to move their lives forward in all aspects of settlement and employment. We considered the special challenges of low level and multi barrier learners and the imperative of digital access and equity. We spoke about the importance of supporting multi barrier newcomers with complex needs who are at varied stages in their settlement journey and who may learn at a different pace. Janet, Paulette, and Karen all shared resources that can be helpful to any English language learning program anywhere in BC. Check them out in the podcast show notes info sheet that goes with, the, with this podcast. I hope our listeners have picked up some ideas they can try out at their agency. I hope they have sparked some new ways of thinking. And that's very much the point of this podcast. Thanks for listening in today. The podcast is hosted by me, Alice Podell. The series is created by AMSA and Lori Cameron is executive producer. Our technical specialist is Connie Raslan. Thanks to our guests, Janet Les, Paulette Corkum, and Karen Alvarez Torres. We gratefully acknowledge the financial support of the province of British Columbia through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Be sure to look for the show notes for this podcast on the AMSA website. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to look for others in the series under resources on AMSA website. For this and more, visit amsa.org. This podcast is a wrap. Thanks for listening. <laughs>